try, that believe that Tesla coils are lumped, can be handled by lumped circuit analysis. And I'll tell you that that's wrong. And they don't. Except during the spark duration, during the primary spark, they do indeed behave like this, and you'll see this on a spectrum analyzer. But in 1909, this marvelous paper by uh, Jay Fleming and Dyke. Dyke was the grad student, Fleming was the professor at uh, Cambridge, I think. And I realized the kind of apparatus that they've got. To, to, they didn't have a spectrum analyzer. They had wave meters back then, so they could tune them. But they looked for the frequencies, because they knew what the solution was going to be. And instead of seeing this, they saw three humps. Three humps. Okay, well, how can that be? It's not in the mathematics. Something's wrong. Okay. In the discussion following Fleming and Dyke's paper, uh, there's a give and take, and they're trying to figure out what's going on here. And Eccles, the guy that, that's the flip flop circuit in, what, 1926 or so? Eccles and Jordan, you know, you know from the Pi Staples uh, multivibrator. Eccles speaks up and says, you know, what's going on is this. That primary break, there's a spark that's going on when you're getting a discharge in the primary. You try to get a primary current, you got a secondary current in here. But something's happening, and the primary current is being broken off, so it's being cut off at a certain time. It goes to zero because the, spark op the circuit opens up, so there's no more primary current. But the secondary is continuing to ring. And when it rings, it rings at its natural resonant frequency, which is going to give itself open in the middle here. Okay. All right, well, some exciting things then happen. By the way, here's, here's a curve you don't see very often. It was actually published in UST about 1926 or so where, you know, these are what these guys are using, spark cap transmitters. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the spectrum response of an IF can and a communications receiver. As you change the coupling, you know, the magnetic coupling between the primary and secondary, um, what happens is if you have weak coupling, you'll get a response that looks like this. And you tighten the coupling up between the primary and secondary and the IF can, the band pass characteristic will begin to pass to this, and then it'll pass to this. And if you look at this, you know, I'm going to plot frequency this way and coupling this way. What happens is these two peaks that you see on spectrum analyzer, F1 and F2, begin to split apart, and it gets splitting. Now, those of you taking quantum mechanics know all about uh, spectral splitting uh, when you've got a couple of systems. Right? It's the same thing that's going on in the, in the, in the communications receiver. And if we plot it this way, here's the current um, versus frequency this way for different couplings. And what happens is the bandpass characteristic of the IF circuit in your receiver rises and then splits. And so if we took a slice through, we'd see something like this. So this double <coughs> spectrum. You, you got, that's just on the side. All right. Well, the point is this, that Gonna run out of time. The energy can be trapped in the uh, secondary in that resonator. So when you look at a Tesla coil, the primary uh, has taken its energy. You know when you conservation of energy for a couple of LC networks, so like an L1C1 and L2C2. W over here is going to be half CD squared or half LX squared. And over here, half CD squared or half LX squared. And when you couple those two together, what you get is that when you solve for the voltage, conservation of energy gives, there's a limitation to how much voltage you can get. In fact, that the maximum voltage rise you can get is the square root of the Secondary capa primary capacitance divided by the secondary capacitance. Primary capacitance is in microfarads, secondary capacitance in picofarads, square root of that, so you get maybe a factor of a thousand or so for your voltage step up. If that's all there was, the Tesla said, I can step up to any number you'd like. I can step up to tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. you can. But you can't do it if the thing is behaving as a long circuit. There's another property of lump circuits, and that is lump circuits only have one resonant frequency. Distributed systems have an infinite number of poles on the left half plane when you look at it. Those of you that have the circuit here. All right, well, what we had to do was then formulate a solution for Maxwell's equations on this helix. And uh, you can write the wave equation on a helical structure, 
uh, subject to certain boundary conditions. And what you get is, and of course it peels off exponentially if you come away radially from the helix. What you get are a bunch of surface waves traveling on the, on the helix, just like on a transmission line. And you can actually calculate the characteristic impedance of this transmission line, the resonator that you see. That helix you see in the Tesla coil is a resonator that's capacitively loaded at the end. Let me get jump all the red tape here. Take your break of that. If you use this solution, by the way, um, it will predict for you. Uh, here's a typical Tesla coil. Uh, something we, we wrote up for the Tesla coil experimenters back, I think, about six or eight years ago. This is the measured bit voltage distribution on the structure. Zero at the base, the whole impedance end, and this is the voltage rise. Here, here's the fundamental where the structure is a quarter wave tall, and then the three quarters tall, five quarters, and so forth. And in fact, the slow wave helical nature of this resonator. Uh, here's the impedance curve for this thing. You can't get this long circuit there. We pass the realm uh, of long circuit analysis. And this is something that they ought to teach the double E's along about junior year. When you pass from bulk circuits to distributed circuits, some wonderful things can happen. You know, wave propagation phenomenon, interference effects begin to happen. These are the resonant frequencies. By the way, these are measured. So indeed, uh, let's see. Uh, this is the error that we have. These were predicted from the helical wave propagation theory, and these are the measured values. The error is well under 3%, of course, uh, typically a tenth of a percent. So that we're right on the money for how this thing behaves. Practical matter, Doctor. How do you measure those volumes along that? Oh, the, it's relative. Just a, if you had a piece of transmission line, how would you measure the voltage? Well, if it was a piece of waveguide, you use a slotted line to probe back and forth. What you can do here is you can your probe up and down, and you can actually see the voltage rise and fall. That's a very good point. Uh, when somebody tells you something, you should always say, well, how do you measure that? How do you do that? Um, something else that's of significance. And this is in a paper that uh, we published over at the uh, conference at uh, Belgrade, uh, I think it was two years ago. Uh, if I keep the frequency constant, I've got an array of Tesla coils here, but all of them are working in this case at 180 kilohertz. I think it's 180. Yeah, 180 kilohertz. And I can either make a very small coil with a big ball, or a very a coil that in essence has a you know, very tiny electrode at the top, very small capacitance, and uh, is electrically a full quarter weight. So here's the voltage distribution on this one. All of these are resonant at the same frequency. These are all Tesla coils that any, that, how many different people? Uh, five, six, six different people could build. Um, which one is the best Tesla coil? Tesla tells you this one. Well, obviously, you, if, if you make the electrode at the top infinitely small, when you break the voltage up, you break down real soon. Over here, the voltage distribution on the coil is linear instead of being this wave interference. And this, you recognize the interference of the upward wave and backward wave, right? So just like you have a standing wave pattern, no loss is the SWR, and this is infinite. The V max up here is S times the V min down here. V min down here is pretty close to zero. Uh, on this structure, it's only 15 degrees tall. That's a piece of transmission line, 15 degrees long. I've got a huge capacity. Tesla says this is the worst coil you can make. It describes it in the literature. A lot of people have said this is the right one, though. And what's happened with them is they've used a lot of energy to drive an electrode that's really big. And what happens there, of course, is when you drive that to breakdown, you'll get a tremendous discharge. But it took a lot of energy. So the amount of energy for discharge is the smallest one. Somebody up here. Typically, good test of coils operate here around 60 to 70 degrees right in this range. And you, you know, what you do if you're designing a test of coils, you figure out, well, how many volts do I want to get? 100,000, 500,000. Yeah. By test of 12 million. Um, you choose the electrode that you want that will hold off 
discharge until you get to that voltage. Now that gives you the ball size. C for a sphere is what uh, four pi epsilon is zero times the radius of the sphere in meters. Right? So now you know the capacitance. You put that on the end of this helical transmission line and then calculate how long that line is going to be. Right? So I mean, that's the design procedure used for a test of um, All right. Ten minutes. Let's get to the. Let's put this. We were engineers. We want to see this fit chart for that. We want to see how that's doing. That's what I want to take next. And we'll see if we can <laughs> close this down here in a few minutes. About uh, here's uh, here's the uh, Tesla coil that Tesla used in Colorado Springs. This is a marvelous instrument, by the way. It's about 10 feet high, 8 feet in diameter. Uh, he's using number six copper wire, uh, spaced about a half an inch, in the one inch, I guess about one inch apart, and uh, pretty close to uh, uh, 10 feet high, 120 inches. So he's got pretty close to 120 turns on this thing. He's got, uh, I think it's one inch copper pipe around the top of there, uh, top of this thing. And this is his feed line coming back to his master oscillator down at the bottom. Um, can't you just picture his hands putting this thing together? I mean, this is a, those of you that have made Tesla coil realize how hard it is to wind a coil. And, and especially something this big, I mean, it's, you know, you're really wrestling a big alligator. But this is a rubber dungeon, just like you have on there. It's a quarter electrically, a quarter wavelength at all, and the frequency he's using. By the way, uh, this is from a German paper by Berger Heiss was published in the ETC back in the early 60s. Um, and uh, he measures the voltage distribution as well. So it's been known that the voltage distribution is not uniform. In fact, with the ordinary transformer, multi element transformer, it'd be linear. You know, if you've got a, a, a transformer, the voltage rise on it is linear as you go from end to end, unless it's capacitive effects. Unless it's capacitor effects, people at Harvard and so forth back in the 30s realized the transmission line effects. So this is in fact a quarter wavelength transmission line that's top loaded capacitively. So if we uh, took it and plotted it on a spin chart, you can see exactly what's going on there. But before we do that, let's look at the family history of uh, cavity resonators. Uh, this is from Raymond and Wettery. We used it when I was teaching here uh, in the microwave course. And this is a foreshort coaxial cavity resonator. Suppose I want to go to lower frequencies or higher voltages. Um, realize the capacitance, it's a coaxial cavity. The capacitance, the capacitance between the top of the cavity and the uh, plate up there. If I want to hold back the break down, uh, back break down, I'll use a ball like that. Um, uh, and I'll try to maybe move the walls out so they don't get discharges. If I want to go to lower frequencies, I can take this piece of, of wire and wind it into a helix. And of course, as the walls go up to infinity, you can see that as they receive infinity, you can see we pass to a, to a, uh, to a Tesla coin, the secondary of the Tesla coin. The model for this, here's our IMAX at the base. We have a certain characteristic of pieces for this, which is the ratio of the E to H as we progress up the transmission line and a certain velocity factor because it's a slow wave helix. And the capacitive loading is the loading at the end. So this, this model um, is a model, but the thing is that it works very well to describe uh, a uh, good Tesla coil. By the way, why do we have to build our Tesla coils down at 10 kilohertz or 100 kilohertz? Why do we make our Tesla coil at 100 megahertz? Okay, what do we do? Here's a Tesla coil that's operating uh, at uh, 125 megahertz. We built this one uh, at, uh, at Mattel. Um, it's a six inch diameter copper pipe, uh, 23 and a half inches tall. The center conductor was a piece of copper tubing. And we have a link couple here. Realize what, what's going on here is this is the primary of the Tesla coil. 
This is the resonator secondary, and we're magnetically coupling.